I guess it's me today. <laughs> I'm glad you guys are all here today, and what a great day to be able to worship God. I love that last song, Gabby. That's, that's always been one of my favorite ones. We want to start something a little bit different today. We're going to be talking about the progression that happens in life, and especially the progression that happens with discipleship. And so, as you look at some of those things that are going on, how does this all begin? I think sometimes we get the idea that, well, it just, you know, kind of, you get to one point and you become a Christian and then you're, well, that's it. And you come sit in church for a while and, well, that's it. But I think there's a lot more to that than that. See, we started new classes today. Why do you have new classes? I mean, didn't we learn it all last time? I mean, did the teachers not do a good job last time? Do we have to have new classes and uh, we're going to teach something else now? Yeah, we're going to teach something else now because it's never that we've finished it all or that we're able to say, I've got it all together. And so we want to be able to look at this progression and, and what exactly does happen with with where Jesus begins. And so turn with me to Matthew chapter 4 and verse 18. And we've got a lot of scriptures today, so just hang on. <laughs> As he begins, he begins to call disciples. He says, while walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea. For they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two brothers, James, the son of Zebedee and John, his brother in a boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called them and immediately they left their boat and their father and followed him. And so this is one of the first times we find Jesus actually calling someone to be disciples. He says, follow me. But it's not just to follow me. It's follow me and I will make you something. I will make you fishers of men. And so as you look at what he's talking about, it's a follow me to be involved with me. It's not just, why don't you walk down the road with me? And when we get to the corner, I'll go my way and you'll go your way. It's not that kind of follow. It's uh, I want you to walk along with me. I want you to learn about me. I want you to be the one that understands what my ministry is about and continues it and furthers it. And so this idea of following along was one that was very, very important to him. They left their nets. It was what he had asked. They walked along and followed him. They were the ones fishing, James and John. I don't know if they had already caught all the fish, but they're mending their nets. Either that or they got it snagged on a rock somewhere, not sure. But one's out fishing and one's mending nets. And so he calls them and immediately they left everything and followed him. But again, this is not just a walk down the road, let's go to the store. This is a longer type of experience. And so that's really what he's beginning to describe here is this longer experience. And in verse 23... It says, and he went throughout all Galilee, teaching in the synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. So his fame spread throughout all Syria and they brought him all the sick and those afflicted with various diseases and pains and those oppressed by demons who were having seizures and paralytics and he healed them. And great crowds followed him from Galilee and Decapolis and from Jerusalem and Judea and beyond the Jordan. And so you have a different crowd in this one. Jesus goes out, he's teaching, and uh, there's a whole other section of people who are with Jesus now. These are the people who are being healed. These are the people who come listen to his teaching. But Jesus did not say to them, follow me. So why are they there if Jesus didn't ask them to follow? Well, they're there because they want to see what's going on. 
This is kind of exciting. You've got somebody who's teaching. He's one of the local teachers, or he's almost getting to celebrity status as he does more and more miracles, as you're able to see more and more things happen, and maybe there's something wrong, and so they come for healing. They come to be able to see this great miracle happen that's somebody else's healing, and so it draws this crowd, and it says great crowds followed him from Galilee. And they begin to bring people to him, those who are sick and who have pain and who are oppressed by demons and seizures and paralytics, and he heals them. Two different types, two different classes. One's a call to follow, to be a disciple, and the other one is the crowd. So what's the difference in a crowd and a disciple? Well, in the beginning, it kind of looks the same thing because they're all following Jesus. They're all just walking along after Jesus. And that's really what they all are doing. They came because the crowd comes because they want to see what's happening. They want to see the healing. They want to see, and they just watch Jesus. They're not really participating with Jesus. They're just kind of watching, kind of observing, kind of the spectator role of, let's see what he's going to do next. It didn't fill their needs. It didn't fill their wants. The only reason they would be involved is my own need. It's kind of like going to the doctor. Have you ever gone to the doctor and you go to the doctor and uh, what do you do? Well, there's a reason why you went to the doctor, right? You don't just go for a visit. I'd like to see a doctor. Why? Well, I've got this really exciting story I wanted to tell them. <laughs> no, it's usually there's something wrong, something hurts, there's some problem going on. So what if you went to the doctor and the doctor begins to say, yeah, I've been having lots of trouble. We've got lots of bills with the practice. And, you know, I think it's just not going all that well here. And, oh, and I saw this great movie. Let me tell you about this great movie that I saw. And you're like, wait a minute. I came to you for you to talk to me about me. Don't you understand? When I go to the doctor, we're going to talk about me. Because after all, that's why I came to the doctor, is for the doctor to tell me about me. And that's kind of the spectator mentality. They went to Jesus to watch Jesus heal their problem so that they could be better off. They weren't trying to get to know Jesus. They, they were there for themselves. And that's what we would do with the doctor. And the doctor's expecting it, so it's not rude, okay? You, know, you shouldn't have to ask, well, how are you doing? How are the kids? You know, all this kind of stuff. So it's not really rude at that point. But there is a difference between someone who's asked to follow, to be a disciple, and someone who, who's just a spectator. So how many things do we do that are long range anymore? Mm -hmm. I think we see this more and more that we quit on things. And especially in families, we kind of quit on things. I was, I was a great parent till they were, you know, six months. <laughs> and then it just kind of went downhill from there. And I just really didn't want to be a parent anymore. So I decided I wouldn't do it. And it's almost like we see that. It goes through different stages. And yeah, I wanted to do that. We raised kids for a few weeks, and then we kind of got tired of it. And why didn't somebody else raise these kids? And we see that happening more and more. Grandma and grandpa are raising kids. So what's the difference in a date and a husband? Both are going to take you out to dinner, right? Right? You'll get a better dinner with the date. <laughs> but would you want the husband? What's the difference in a mom and a housekeeper? Is there a lot? Well, the housekeeper's there for the money. The mom has invested her whole life. Or the babysitter. 
what do we do that is long term? I will do this forever. Even when you buy a house, when you buy a house, you get a 30 year mortgage, right? I mean, if you're rich enough, you can knock it down to 15, but say you get a 30 year Are you going to stay in that house for 30 years? You signed the deal. You said you were going to be in the house. I mean, you said you were going to at least pay for the house for 30 years, wouldn't you? But really what happens today is nobody has the idea, I'm going to live in this house for 30 years. I'm just going to take out that long of a mortgage, and I'm going to live in it till I decide to live somewhere else. And then I'm going to sell it so I can get to my other place and get to my other place and get to my other place. We don't really do long term. Long-term friendships. How many friendships do you have that are however old you are? 20 years, 30 years. Do we do friendships? Do we do jobs like that? Do you have a career where you've been there for 20 years, same place, same company, or 30 years, or 40 years? No, we change all the time, don't we? We don't have things that we commit to. And so what happens with church and all that? Well, we're just here for now, right? We're committed to Jesus. We're not committed to church. We have a big God concept, and that means there's no details. And we do want people to know God. We do think that's important. We do think he ought to be in the world. We love God, but eh, maybe not enough to obey him all the time. We want grace, but... Not enough to have to give up anything and provide grace for anyone else or forgiveness. We'd like for everyone to know about God, but not enough to teach, right? There's a difference. I want to come, and I think everybody ought to know, but I didn't want to be the one to have to do that. So there gets to be a difference between who's a church member and who's a disciple. So what is a disciple? What is one? What difference does that make? Well, this is not a technical definition, but I think a disciple is one who does what Jesus says. I mean, if he says, follow me, then you're going to follow him. You're going to be the one who's there with him. He's there for a relationship with Jesus. He's there to advance the kingdom that Jesus talks about. He's there for living grace. He's there to be filled and feel the power of the Holy Spirit. He's there to live his life for Jesus. There's an interesting passage in Matthew chapter 10, verse 24 and 25, where he's talking about the disciple. He says, a disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It's enough for the disciple to be like his teacher, and the servant was like his master. And if they've called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? And so the disciple is one who becomes like his master. And that's really the whole goal. That's what he's trying to accomplish, is just to be like the master, like Jesus. And so when you think about that and you realize, okay, if that's what a disciple is, and I'm not trying to be better than him, well, I mean, who can be better than Jesus anyway? But that's who we would pick. So who would you pick if you want to be like that master? We wouldn't pick anybody who's poor or who'll die early, right? We don't want to be like that. We want to be like someone who's successful, who has a great position, who has lots of, lots of money and power and wealth and everything. And we don't want to pick somebody who's going to be abused and ridiculed. Why would we pick that? We don't pick masters who are called the devil. And yet that's what Jesus says to them. If they called me the devil, they're going to call you the devil too. And they chose him on purpose, right? Why? Why would you pick somebody like that? To, I mean, why wouldn't it be a successful Pharisee that had lots of money in the big house? I think it's because Jesus has the words of eternal life. Because he's the son of God. Because he's the one that makes all the difference in this. And so a disciple becomes like his master. And I think sometimes we've got the, we hope to be better than him, but he says, no, that's where you're going to be. 
And so the question really today is, do you want to be a disciple? In, in Luke chapter 14, there was a crowd that was following him, going along with him. Not the same as disciples following him. But if you look at verse 25, a great crowd accompanied him. And he turned and he said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sister, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. And which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going out to encounter another king in war will not sit down first to deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation, he asks for terms of peace. Therefore, if any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. The crowd's already there. The crowd's already following. They're accompanying him. They are walking along with him. And he turns to them and says, you can't be my disciple. What Jesus wants to do is to teach the crowd that does follow him to be disciples. It, it's not an automatic. I think sometimes we've thought of the first person who follows Jesus is, well, that's a disciple. No, that's just a person following right now. They're just crowd. And they may get to be disciple, and it may look the same at first, but disciple is very, very different from crowd. And I think especially we see that today when we start looking around and trying to figure out, well, what is, what is it that we have today? And as the Bible talks about it, he says he talks about disciple in a whole different way. Because this really is a killer for family ministry, isn't it? Let me teach you how to hate your parents so that you can be my disciple. Why would you do that? I mean, how does this even fit in? Isn't the whole point that we're all good families and we all get along and we all... And Jesus says, I'm not trying to teach you that. I'm trying to teach you to be my disciple. And if you are my disciple, it will cause problems in families. Why? Because there's a direct conflict in who gets priority. And Jesus says, I am priority over family. Well, that really messes things up, doesn't it? How are we going to do that? Should we be a disciple or should we be a family? Aren't we both from God? Can we do both? And you know what? Disciples did. But families understood Jesus comes first. Always Jesus comes first. And so it was, it's going to seem like hate to your family at least, but it's not an emotional thing, but it's that Jesus comes first. And sometimes the things that we would do may, may seem that way. He says, take up your cross and follow me. Basically, it's daring them to be a disciple. And then he talks about the guy who's going to build a tower. And, you know, he should have counted the cost. Does he have enough to finish? And we completely misunderstand this parable. We should always count the cost and know that we have enough to finish, right? Isn't that what he's saying? Because that way we will never run out and we will only begin things that we know we can complete. No. No. Absolutely the opposite of what he's actually saying. Because if you see this tremendous life that Jesus sets forth, was he able to finish? He died in the process. He didn't get to the end and become an old man and say, look at this great kingdom I have built. 
he died in the process. And I think that's what's important for us to understand about all of this. We mock someone who gives up and does not finish. We honor people who give their lives for a cause. Both did not finish, but one believed in it. And so we honor them. It takes renouncing all that you have. The cost is everything. And then he gives you the idea of going into a fight. You've got 10,000, they've got 20,000. How do you win that? And so is it just a strategy game? Is that what it's all about? Is it about saying, well, okay, we're going to have better strategy than everybody else. And so don't ever fight unless you're able to win. That's the point? No. It wasn't the point at all. He says there's no honor in desertion because you're losing. But there is honor in dying for a cause. And you going against someone with 20,000 when you have 10,000 says, well, let's just don't even fight. Let's just back out of here. and let's, let's just surrender. And Jesus doesn't surrender. But he dies for a cause. It isn't that Jesus will win in the short term. But he does win in the long term. The cost is that you lay down your life. And so that's the cost that he wants you to count. Is what I lay down my life here. Is this what it would mean? Is this what it would make the difference? And so as you look at this, it's important that we understand that Jesus came to make disciples. There are several times where this is mentioned. John calls himself the disciple. He doesn't even use his name in his book as he writes the gospel. He calls himself bigger than that, the disciple whom Jesus loved. But when you start looking at this word disciple and who it describes, it's important for us to understand this and realize how the Bible talks about it and how God sees it. And I want to give you an example today about one of the things that he talks about with a disciple. And this is found in Acts chapter 9. As Saul was going to Damascus, he is surrounded by, he encounters Jesus. And is sent into Damascus blind and stays there for three days. And then verse 10 of Acts chapter 9, it says, Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. Notice that. I'm sure there was a lot of church people. Because Paul had gone with letters not to get one guy named Ananias. Paul had gone with letters to get all the people there who believe in Jesus, who have anything to do with Jesus. But when it comes down to this, it says there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise up and go to a street called Straight and to the house of Judas. Look for a man of Tarsus named Saul, for behold, he is praying. And he had seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. There is a disciple in Damascus. What does that mean? That means God can tap him on the shoulder at any time because he is completely 100% sold out for God. And whatever God has for him to do, he will do. No matter what it takes, no matter what it's about, no matter how much it's going to cost him. And so he says, Ananias, here I am, Lord. Don't you love the response right away? Whatever it is. Whatever it takes. He says, I want you to go to a guy named Saul. And he even gives him the address. This is hilarious. The straight street, house of Judas, man from Tarsus, Saul, guy praying. I'm not sure we could find that guy today, but, you know, that's the directions. Because I already showed him your coming. Really? But I'm not comfortable doing this. He says, I already showed him you're coming. You are a disciple. Because a disciple will always go. There is no giving up. There is no question. I already sent him the vision that you were coming. 
to regain his sight, to make him a Christian, to give him the Holy Spirit. But Ananias has heard of Saul. And he's the one Saul came to get. And now I've got to go to him. What kind of cost counting takes place there? Let's see, here's a guy with authority to put me in prison and kill me. And God wants me to go to him and give him the Holy Spirit and make him a Christian. What's the cost? The cost is that guy's in trouble because God is sending me. And that's how you've got to be able to see it. Verse 17, so Ananias departed and he entered the house and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me. Don't you love that? (laughs) I'm the guy. He has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight, and he rose and was baptized. And taking food, he was strengthened. And for some days he was with the disciples at Damascus, and immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. And so it's Ananias who came to him, he lays his hands on him, and, and he receives his sight. Those were the two things. And he wants him to receive the Holy Spirit. So what did he do? He was baptized just like on Pentecost and that makes you able to receive the Holy Spirit. And so that's exactly how the passage reads. It might seem a little bit confusing, but that's why he baptized him is that's where the Holy Spirit comes in. And so now he's been able to convert him and Saul, because of this, immediately goes out preaching. Well, he's already got great knowledge in that Old Testament, and they don't have a New Testament yet. And he's already a professor, so he already knows how to teach, and he's already got the information. He just had it all mixed up. And he says, you know what? All those prophecies about Jesus are about Jesus. And so let me go out and tell people about Jesus. And so he throws, I imagine that first day in synagogue. Don't you know that was a crazy day? Paul's here, we're going to get rid of all those Christians, and Paul stands up to preach, and he goes, okay, let's be against all those Christians, and jaws drop as he starts with, Jesus Christ is the Son of God. What's the cost there? Go and stand up in a synagogue and declare Jesus as Son of God, when they know the very reason that you came was to be able to put Christians in jail. Well, the cost is you're going to be hunted, threatened to be killed, and the only way to escape is over the wall in a basket. That's what begins. And as he escapes, he gets away, he goes to Jerusalem. Well, they'd heard about Saul and knew Saul. He's the guy who's putting everybody in prison. We know Saul, but same problem with the church. So... As you look at at verse 26 in Acts chapter 9, when he had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples. And they were all afraid of him, for they did not believe that he was a disciple. You can't change that fast. How can you become a disciple in that amount of time? And so what do you do to prove that you're a disciple? Show him your card. We have a letter from the elders in Damascus. It's too small a place. They didn't have elders yet. Show them your wet baptism clothes. I don't I mean, what else can you do to say I'm a disciple? But it says in verse 27, But Barnabas took him and he brought him to the apostles and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord who spoke to him and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. And so he went in and out among them at Jerusalem, teaching boldly in the name of the Lord. And he spoke and disputed against the Hellenists, but they were seeking to kill him. 
And when the brothers learned of this, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. So Jerusalem Christians didn't believe he was a disciple. They didn't think he was real. I mean, how can this have happened? We know people don't change that quickly, but absolutely he did change that quickly. And so when Barnabas goes to him, he finds out, okay, how can we prove that you're a disciple? How would you prove today that you're a disciple? Well, you showed up at church this morning, right? I mean, show them the card that you filled out that you stuck in the collection plate. Long as you did that, you're good, right? We can say, yeah, we were here. We've got record of their attendance. But how do you prove you're a disciple? So Barnabas goes to him and he interviews him. He says he has seen the Lord. He has spoken to Jesus directly. And he's preached boldly that Jesus is the Son of God as soon as he was converted. Marks of a disciple in every case are things that they did. You do not have someone called a disciple who did nothing. Every single time. That's what it's about. It's a position that does things. It means they are involved. It means you can count on them. It means they have great faith. It means they are involved with the work of God. There are so many of them. Joseph of Arimathea, a disciple, asked for the body of Jesus. It's a risky, risky thing, isn't it? When you ask for the body of the guy that they just killed, would you be next? John calls himself a disciple. Again, in Acts chapter 9, I mean, we are, Paul says, I am a disciple. Acts chapter 9, I thought this was interesting. There was in Joppa a disciple named Tabitha, which translated means Dorcas. She was full of good works and acts of charity. Seems like a very simple line. What do you mean there was in Damascus or in Joppa a disciple? named Tabitha. Well, you can tell because of all the good works and acts of charity that she did. Always the action is associated with the disciple. And you already know where I'm going today. So are you a disciple? What does that really mean? I think sometimes we get confused the difference between a disciple and a church member because we've got people who come in and fill out the card and Sometimes they're members here and sometimes they're not. And it gets very confusing, doesn't it? Because some people will say, well, I place membership. And some say, well, I don't want to place membership because I don't want you to know I'm here. Or I don't want to have to do anything. I'm not sure what that means. You know, we've filled out the card, but we're, let's, let's check just visiting. Okay, that's fine. We're just glad you're here, all right? But it gets kind of strange because people will come and they'll fill out the card and they'll even place membership and say, okay, I want to be a member of the Mesa Church of Christ. That's great. We're glad to have you here. Uh, we would love for you to be involved and to become this disciple that really is involved in doing all of these things. Well, they come and, you know, they're here for however long. And uh, I think it's happened several times that I've been here. Somebody will call and say, well, I'm a member there. I'm like, Really? I never heard of you. Yeah, I'm a member. I've been a member there since 1986. Okay. Who are you again? And in 1986, I went and I placed my membership there. And I haven't been back since. But I'm a member there. Does that seem right? No. No. We are disciples. By very definition, you are involved. And if that's not where you are, then I'm sorry. If you don't show up for a few years, we take your name off. You left. I went out. I'm not involved. I have no association. If you want to be a part of us again, come back. But you're not a member if you're not involved. 
That's the definition of the term. That's what's biblical. That's what he calls us to be, is disciples. Now, you can come in here and sit all you want. And we are so excited to have you here, and we're glad to have you here. But if you want to be part of this church, to be a disciple of Jesus, it takes a little bit more, doesn't it? And I want to challenge you with that. Because you can come and sit all you want. And we're glad to have you and nobody's going to bother you. And, well, we might bother you a little bit, actually. Because <laughs> somebody will probably be talking to you about all of this. And we want to have you here as part of us. So that we can be active. So that we can be working. So that we can be all together. But I want you to think about what Jesus called a disciple. And even if it's Tabitha. She's full of good works and acts of charity. We have quilters, right? Disciple. Man, they're involved. They're doing stuff. They're doing all kinds of good works. We count attendance. Please do not settle for your name being on a list. We need to be disciples. We need to make disciples. Jesus' great commission was to go make disciples, not count church attendance. Disciple is a lot more. That we would be like him, that we are given a task, that we have a responsibility, that we're trusted to act. And you see this all the way through. It is so consistent in the New Testament. This was a disciple. There's no question that he would do what God wanted. I saw this the other day. When God wants to write a new story, he starts with a disciple. When God wants Mesa for Jesus Christ, he starts with disciples. We don't need to be spectators. We need him to know that he can trust us. We need him to know we have counted the cost, and even if we lose, we will lose for him. We will give up our life there. That's what makes the difference when you can be a disciple. It begins at repentance. It begins with baptism. It begins with being added to the church. That is not a disciple. That's a new Christian. That's a member. But when you become a disciple is when you gain some of this responsibility. It's what you do. Disciple begins, and that's why I teach so much about how we grow and about how we develop. It's not just a matter of getting you into water and saying you're baptized and your sins are forgiven. That's great. Jesus told us to make disciples. Now we begin with the real process of what he wants you to be and what he wants you to do. That's what we're trying to do here. And we want you to be part of us. If you want to sit and sing and just or listen to us sing, that's great. We're glad to have you. But we want you to be part of Jesus Christ too. Because it's going to make all the difference. For God to be able to trust you like that, for that to be the thing that says, this is a disciple. I hope you'll make that decision today. Talk to our elders. Say, I want to be part of this. Because we really are trying to be disciples of Jesus Christ. Okay, that's number one. If we can help you, if we can be part of you, if you can be part of us, let us know. Come, we can pray with you. Let's all stand and sing.